Trey Bowles, thanks for joining me in the Spirit Farm podcast, buddy. And it's so good to see you. I'm so glad to be here. This is going to be fun. It is great to see you too. You're coming to us uh, from Dallas, Texas. Am I right? Yeah, Dallas, Texas. Some people call it the promised land. Um, but <laughs> it, it is the best place in the country to be, live, to build a, build a business, build a family, whatever you want to do. This is the place. You're like a you're like a Dallas, Texas evangelist slash ambassador. Uh, you like you really love that place. Well, I tell people I don't just drink the Kool-Aid. I, I help stir it. So, yeah, I sort of about <laughs> 10 years ago decided, um, having lived all over the country, that um, Dallas is where I was going to set up my roots and is where I was going to stay. And being an entrepreneur that's built a business in a bunch of different cities, I believe you can build a company in any city that you want. So if I was going to be here and I was going to live here, then I was going to help entrepreneurs and I was going to uh, try to make this a better city and in the process build my companies here for the rest of my life. So that's kind of what I've been doing and, and partially why I'm so excited about Dallas and why I know so much about why I think it's a great place to be. Yeah, you know a lot about it and you've helped you've helped make it a better place and you've helped other people make it a better place. I want to get into all of that part of your journey. Uh, but first let's bounce backwards uh, and and kind of move our way back forwards because uh, you and I met on a trip to uh, Africa in like Rwanda, wasn't it? It was Rwanda, like <laughs> 2006, six maybe. maybe. Yeah, 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 and yeah, uh, and yeah, and and hit it off. I was a big fan of yours immediately. And the interesting little little tidbit about your story was that you started a company called Morpheus. Uh, that was like the same as Napster, right? So when all the music stuff was happening and people were stealing songs and everything, you were like the Napster competitor. That was your thing, Morpheus. Well, we were actually better than Napster because we <laughs> didn't get sued out of existence. Like they, we didn't get sued, um, but we had a little bit difference in our technology that made it uh, so that it was not illegal, um, which is kind of the same as being legal. But at the time, you know, not illegal is good. So, um, yeah, actually, Napster started before we did and really built the market for what would be peer-to-peer -peer file sharing or file sharing in general, as we know today, iTunes, um, that kind of stuff, or yeah. Spotify or Pandora. Um, right. We just happened to launch at the right time, right after Napster had gone under. And then we sort of, right place, right time, ended up seeing really great rapid growth, um, learned a ton, did get sued, uh, but we won. It eventually went to the Supreme Court and then the decision was upheld, so that's good. But yes, I was very similar to what Napster was doing, just not illegal. <laughs> well, well done, well done. So, so was that your first entrepreneurial endeavor, like other than a lemonade stand as a kid or whatever, or had you already been on that journey? I think it was the first time I realized I was an entrepreneur, but I had done several things before, um, even in college, getting into sort of music promotion and, and getting, you know, kids across the country to help promote bands and, and, and leverage a viral um, movement back then, um, sort of grassroots. And then my first company was a friend of mine started um, was a dot com. So I got to help build businesses there. So, so, but it was after Morpheus that I was like, oh gosh, I think I'm a, I think I'm an entrepreneur. Um, and where I began to understand what that was and what that meant and the turmoil that it would set my life and those around me into, but also the exciting, amazing journey and addiction to some degree that um, has been the, the last 20 years of my life. Yeah. So what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? Like when you're when you're breaking it down for you, maybe, or when you're evaluating because you you're engaged now full time. Your world is helping people start things and connecting people and all the. Um, what what makes up an entrepreneur? I have more questions that follow it up with that. But like but like when when you think of entrepreneur, people think, "Am I an entrepreneur? Am I you know you know how what's the, what's the makeup? How do how do you know if someone is or isn't?" Well, it's not always easy to tell if somebody's an entrepreneur, um, and uh, because a lot of people that aren't entrepreneurs start things, and and it's very possible to be entrepreneurial and still not be an entrepreneur. But when I think of entrepreneur, I think about somebody who has a conviction, a passion, a mission that they want to see accomplished, 
and they are willing to a take a risk and step out in courage to try and accomplish that and b most importantly they are willing to be persistent and disciplined and diligent enough to see that mission through um, they have to be willing to sacrifice because it takes an enormous amount of time. Most people who think they know what hard work is have never tried to be an entrepreneur because the sacrifice is so great. Mm. Um, uh, but at that point, they're, they're, they're a, a managed set of risks that you have to deal with and a committed amount of persistence you have to, you have to showcase in order to make it work um, and build something and grow it. But uh, it's not necessarily about how big of a company you can be. It's not about how fast you grow something. There's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that are small business owners that make $50,000 a year and that pays for their bills. And there's lots of entrepreneurs out there that sell companies for billions of dollars. It's really about your personal mission, your personal passion um, and your commitment to see that through. Yeah. And would you say that you can be an entrepreneur and, and do it as a side hustle? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, you, you know, I think we have a, um, and, and if you ask most entrepreneurs, if they were honest with you, most of them don't, would not say they're entrepreneurs because they want to make a lot of money. Most of them say they're entrepreneurs because they have a passion about something. They wanted to see if they could accomplish it. They enjoy the freedom that comes with it, the autonomy and ability to go out and, and sort of put something on you. It's kind of like the idea of getting the ball at the end of the game. Like I want the ball, give it to me. And if, if it fails, then I'm okay. You know, I'll take that. But if it succeeds, I, I enjoy that as well. So, so it could be a hot side hustle. It could be something that didn't, doesn't generate revenue. It could be something that you just love and you're passionate about. But I think, um, and for a long time, a lot of people, specifically small business owners, didn't see themselves as entrepreneurs. They saw themselves as a freelancer or as, an independent contractor or whatever. And so I try to encourage people to recognize when that is in fact a moniker that they can wear and proudly put that on and step forward in that because it is it is not for everybody. Uh, entrepreneurs aren't better than other people. In fact, we're kind of weird and annoying and, um, and fixated sometimes, but that also is such an amazing, amazing, um, the criteria and quality that somebody can have that really sort of looks at creating culture, changing culture, modifying the way things are done. And what we don't think about all the time is the most famous people in our cultures, the most you know celebrities and, and sports athletes and, and things like that are all entrepreneurs, right? They're representing and building a brand. And so if we think about it like that, the responsibility of entrepreneurship is huge because we are shaping the future of the world for people. And uh, what excites me is that that can be done in a negative way or that can be done in a positive way. So I'm trying to find as many people as I possibly can to teach them how to be diligent, persistent, positive, collaborative um, forces in building entrepreneurial endeavors all over the globe. I love it, dude. And so you're, you're trying to teach them and work with them. So are those skills that are, that are taught, uh, is there a predisposition that makes you more likely to be able to adopt those skills versus... Sure. That's an interesting question. Is, is an entrepreneur born or made? Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, my argument is that like anything, you could be born with an aptitude to be better at something. Um, but the reality is that not all entrepreneurs choose to be entrepreneurs. Right now is a, is a perfect example. There's people who are losing jobs and not able to find new ones. There's people that, you know, fin finish their career and retire and want to come back in. So sometimes we're entrepreneurs out of necessity. Um, we're entrepreneurs out of no other possible reason. But, but to get back to your question, I, I don't think you have to be born an entrepreneur, even though I think some people have, you know, a head start in that direction. Um, I teach college over at SMU, a local uh, university here, and, uh, and I teach high school kids too, you know, uh, from time to time. And the thing I ask my students on the first day of class is how many of you want to be entrepreneurs? 95% of them raise their hand. I then asked them at the end of the semester, how many of you want to be entrepreneurs? 5% raise their hand. And then what I say to them is, well, it's good. This wasn't a course on entrepreneurship. This, was a, this wasn't a course for entrepreneurs. This was a course to teach you entrepreneurial skill sets that you can use in anywhere that you decide to spend your life. 
whether you're an attorney, an entrepreneur, or a barista at Starbucks. That's what we want to teach people. So yes, you absolutely can learn how to be an entrepreneur. You can learn how to be entrepreneurial. And the reality about entrepreneurship um, that is where we're all starting from sort of the same starting block is that until you've done it, you have no idea what you're doing. You don't know what you don't know. And so when you are trying to figure it out, um, you're just like everybody else. You may have an expertise in one area, but you don't know everything that you need to know. And right. so I don't care who you are, every entrepreneur needs to learn new things. And most of them, if they're smart, are constantly learning new things. Because this, the, one of the things that separates entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs from not successful entrepreneurs is how quickly you can make mistakes. And even more importantly, how quickly you learn from those mistakes, because we're all going to make them. Um, and that's why we encourage mentorship as a key component of that education process. Because if you have mentors, people that have been there and done that before, they're really removing obstacles that stand in your way of actually being able to build your business. And so, so it's a mixture of, because entrepreneurship isn't an intellectual thing, it's an experiential thing. And so the quicker we can um, speed up your experiential process or listening to people who have been been there and done that before, that gives you the best opportunity to be successful. So, so yes, there is a, an element of being born gifted in that way, um, but a lot of it comes through education, mentorship, community, relationship, and network. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, Trey. And I, I've, I think that that aligns with my personal experience and other spheres of life. You know, you might have a predisposition to basketball based on your height and whatever, but who's going to work the hardest? You, you, you know, talent doesn't always win the championship. Who's going to work the hardest? Who's going to learn? Who's going to put the right pieces around them? So I think that's an encouragement probably for a lot of people that even if they didn't grow up thinking I'm an entrepreneur or they weren't like groomed by their parents to, you know, start companies and whatever, it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that it doesn't work for them. There are entrepreneurial uh, principles and stuff that, that we can develop, that we can learn, that we can put in place and, and make stuff happen. Are you seeing more people in now in the 20th, 21st century and 2020 and 2021 leading into 2021, uh, gravitating more and more this direction? Not like it's a trend, but maybe out of necessity. Maybe it's just like something that we're waking up to, like conviction, opportunity, the freedom, the not aligning with the big you know, things anymore that have to like, you know, run our lives. What are you seeing from, from the perch where you sit in terms of what's happening in our culture and entrepreneurs uh, popping up or getting momentum? Well, interestingly enough, and most people wouldn't uh, know this or even, or even guess this, but for the past three decades, entrepreneurship has been on a decline. Really, um, and 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 I, I think it's become more visible to most people. I think people are. I, I don't think three decades ago people were saying I'm an entrepreneur quite as often um, as they do now. But it's been on the decline, and we're trying to combat that. And I think times like COVID and global pandemics and recessions and things like that heighten the number of entrepreneurs that enter the enter the workforce. And that that is often, as I said before, out of necessity. I lost my job. Can't get another job. I got to do something. And so I'm going to do start, something. start this. And I think what's really unique in the time of COVID is that when you hear people say this a lot, but the world has changed. It'll never be the same. Now, to what degree? I don't know. Will we always do Zoom calls and never go meet in person? Probably not. But there'll be elements of life that will always be a little bit different. And so um, so that's why there's this inner this rush to enter the market with new ideas. It's because on one sense, there's a lot of services that need to be given out there. I can't tell you the number of entrepreneurs I've met in the last six months that have launched companies that do sanit sanitization and cleaning and things like that. And it was because there was an opportunity. I heard a story about a, a guy the other day that got into the PPP space. He made $50 million this year, right? There was a need. He stepped in and he filled it, right? Wait, what does that mean, the PPP space? PPE. Um, PPE. Uh, the private uh, protection equipment that they use, the face masks and the and the and the yes. gear and all the stuff that they use in medical professionals and frontline, but also the stuff that you and I buy at the store, like yes, that kind of stuff. If you saw an opportunity and he 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 exploited it, but the other so so those are the initial needs. Like what what are what are products or services that people need today because of COVID, and people are jumping in and providing that. 
Um, so the secondary piece is, well, we don't know what the market's going to look like moving forward. We don't know what the world's going to look like moving forward. So some entrepreneurs are saying, I'm going to tell you what it's going to look like. And the interesting thing about that is when you're entering a new market and I'm and entering a new world that nobody's ever been in before, most of us are just going to believe somebody if they say, I, I know what's going to happen. Right? <laughs> We're all followers. And so entrepreneurs stepping up in that, coming up with new innovations is important. And then the final piece is, all businesses are having to reinvent themselves now. They're having to figure yeah. out what's going to be different about my business moving forward. Yeah. Um, what new products or service lines. And even a lot of people during COVID are having to say, well, shoot, if I had any connection with people in person at all whatsoever, I've got to redefine that. So how do I do that? And so that's spurring new product lines, new opportunities, or just a redirection of how I'm offering my services to my current client base or customer base. So times like this really do see an, an increase in um, entrepreneurship for a bunch of different reasons. But I think it's exciting because the innovation that we're going to see and the things coming out of this that we're going to see is going to be is going to be revolutionary um, as it pertains to this community. And specifically, I mean, if you just look at education a year ago, this wasn't the case, but now every single kid in the country has done distance or virtual learning. Every one of them. Right. Some of them are still doing it. Think about the opportunities that exist from there. A friend of mine owns a company that does online classes for colleges. His business exploded, like exploded yeah. because all of a sudden something that was beginning to happen became a necessity. Mm-hmm. And so necessity. More, more and more things like that are happening, whether it's a luxury, leisure, or a necessity, more businesses are starting during times like this. And it's scary, but it's also really exciting. Yeah, and lots of businesses are starting, but even as you mentioned, uh, established businesses are having to think more entrepreneurially, right? Because they're they're rethinking their methodologies and the things that were were just kind of going along fine aren't going along fine anymore, and they have to almost think like entrepreneurs within the structure uh, in order to to be relevant in the future. Do you have definitely? And then that's just yeah. I was just going to say, are you coaching some of those people too? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, what we did, one of the things that we did when COVID launched was we saw a disproportionate amount of the paycheck, um, protection program money going to, um, white entrepreneurs. And so we launched a a fund called the, um, Revived Dallas Small Business Relief Fund, which was dedicated primarily to minority and women-owned businesses because not in the first round of PPP funding, 95% of the money was not going to women or minority-run businesses. So wow. we came together with our community, uh, f- f- uh, philanthropists, businesses, things like that, which we have so many amazingly philanthropic corporations in Dallas, and they put about $3.5 million into a fund that we're, we've distributed a little over – a million now, it'll be another, it'll be two and a half million in a couple of weeks. And then we'll get through that three and a half million before too long. But it was specifically to do one thing, two things. One, to, to stop the bleeding, to give these um, entrepreneurs and small business owners an opportunity to sort of take a break, purchase a piece of equipment that they need, pay off a, a credit bill that they needed to pay off, whatever that may be. The other component of that fund was uh, a program called the Fast Start Mentor Program, where we were bringing other people in the community to come in and offer um, strategic tactical consulting services or mentoring services. And what we're hearing from a lot of those companies, those companies that are having to reinvent themselves, is, wow, the money was really helpful and really, really important, but the mentorship was invaluable because people are helping me not solve an immediate problem, but develop a business for the future. And so I've got countless, you know, stories and anecdotes of, of companies that have come in and said, man, this, I, I wouldn't have known to do this. I wouldn't have thought to do this. Um, but because we are able to surround them with, with subject matter experts from different, you know, businesses and different um, divisions, they're able to come in and offer solutions that have really, really been transformational to those companies. So good, dude. Now, when you talk about that, you're, you're talking about, an entity that you run is it is it uh, the Center for Entrepreneurship in Dallas? So I am I am the, the founder and uh, executive chairman of an organization called the, the Dallas Entrepreneur Center. Now it's called the DEC Network. Um, and so I launched the fund 
um, in connection with the deck for as an initiative of the deck. Um, but I don't work there. I just I just am the founder and uh, and chairman. So I get to participate in a lot of work they're doing. But we've got a great team who are accomplishing some some re- really amazing things and really um, making a huge difference in the community as a collaborative force of pulling together organizations. Um, you know, we, we probably have over a hundred organizations in North Texas, um, or Dallas Fort Worth that are what we call business support organizations. And so the deck is one of them, but there's a ton of them. And so what we're trying to do is understand the needs of the entrepreneur, the offerings of the, of the other business support organizations. So we can directly connect an entrepreneur to the best organization or set of organizations that exist to, to help him or her, um, be successful. That's so good, dude. And you're obviously focused in Dallas, but when people, when they have that need, how do they, how do they get aligned? Like how do, how do they show up, come to you so that you can begin to make those connections? Well, so over the last about eight years, um, probably around 2013, I launched um, the deck. Uh, 2011, I launched another uh, nonprofit and then I built this um, department at SMU, this entrepreneurship department. I sort of committed myself to doing nonprofit stuff for for at least five years. And um, why did you make that decision, Trey? Uh, so a couple of reasons. One, I was I was building this entrepreneurship department at SMU. I was I just launched this leadership development organization um, in Dallas with the current mayor. And I was at a place where I was like, look, these are two sort of fledgling burgeoning businesses. If I go launch a for profit business, these are always going to come second. Yeah. to that focus. And I need to really focus on this. So I sort of just said, look, I'm going to spend five years just doing nonprofit stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and I went to my wife and said, look, this probably won't work because most businesses don't. Um, but if it does, I'm just going to do it for five years. And so I was able to launch four different nonprofits in this entrepreneurship department and pay myself through one of them. Um, and then build out those things up. And then at five years began to replace myself in all these different organizations. And I still am involved in, in a board capacity in some cases, but, but I'm no longer doing that full time. And, um, part of that was because you can't live on no money forever. And part of it was because I just, I really have a passion for, for business in general. The fact that those were nonprofits, what didn't matter to me, it was the, it was the proper legal structure for what I, what I wanted to build, but I still treated them just like they were businesses. And so to, you know, to answer your question, one of those nonprofits that we built actually was a, um, a continuance of something that the, the co-founder of AOL, Steve Case had built um, in 2011 to 2014, which was focused on helping high growth entrepreneurs across the country be successful. And his initiative, which was a partnership between him, the Obama uh, White House, and the Kauffman Foundation, um, was a three-year program. And they got people like me all over the country to come in and help build entrepreneurial initiatives in their states or regions to do that. Well, after that ended, I went back to him and said, look, um, I think there's something really valuable here in the network. Not, Not programs per se, but the people. And so we launched an initiative Uh, called the Startup Champions Network, which has 150 plus people in it across the U.S. in about 48 or 49 states. We're trying to get to that that 50th in Puerto Rico, um, which is people that did what I did in Dallas to support entrepreneurs. And so it's possible that your listeners or viewers, wherever they may be, are probably in a region that has what we call a champion or an ecosystem builder that you would reach out to and get connected and they could help you with your ideas in, in a certain area. And so um, that's that's the best way for people to get connected and involved is to, is to look, at, look and see what's going on in the startup communities in their cities or regions. And there's probably somebody um, dedicated to supporting them um, that is out there and working for it. And a lot, of, a lot of those people are doing it. They're not getting paid, right? They're doing it just because they're passionate about supporting entrepreneurs and supporting entrepreneurs in their specific geographic region. And I can promise you, they are as annoyingly excited about their city and their region as I am about Dallas. Um, so they all believe that they can create some, some really awesome value out of that. And interestingly enough, through that organization, we actually created a partnership with Toyota, which is based in Dallas, to go help Toyota find emerging companies in certain marketplaces. Um, right? Their first project they were working on was mobility. It was fintech. 
um, and some other areas that they're finding. But the exciting thing is that corporations are coming in, especially during this time and recognizing we can't effectively innovate. We're the Titanic and moving our organization doesn't happen really easy. But let's create this connection line to early stage businesses, entrepreneurs and innovators and see if we can come in and leverage that their ability to be agile, their ability to, to constantly change and pivot as they need to but then provide them some value that can help them maintain and grow and, and reach sustainability as a business as well. So long-winded answer, but there are people in your regions, wherever you live, that are there like what I did to help support you. And so reach out and, and find out what those are. So what would someone search for? The the Champions Network or is it is it going to be called a variety of things? So you can search for the Startup Champions Network. The, 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 the target audience for that is, is me to join and participate. Gotcha. But I would just search uh, Startup, you know, Phoenix or Startup Tallahassee or um, Startup Organizations here, uh, Entrepreneur Support Organizations. What, just Google that kind of stuff. Things will gotcha. start to pop up. Find friends of yours that are also entrepreneurs. Um, look up things like Meetup at stuff at meetup.com or um, Eventbrite, things things like that where they're posting those those events and you begin to find those entrepreneurial stuff. The great thing about the entrepreneurial community, not just in Texas and, and North Texas, but across the country is it's very inclusive. If you call somebody and say, hey, I want to get involved, they're like, great, and you're in. And they start to, mm -hmm. to figure out how they can support and serve you in that. And, um, and they want to help entrepreneurs um, in any way they can, regardless of you know, age, right? Regardless of gender or ethnicity or political affiliation or sexual orientation, it's really about um, the fact that we're all, as entrepreneurs, we're all in this together. And there is a shared, um, there's a shared turmoil as an entrepreneur or with other entrepreneurs and that you know what they're going through. There's also a shared joy and understanding of what it takes and what it's like. And in some cases, how amazing it is to hit these inflection points um, that are are so uh, phenomenal and incredible to your development as an entrepreneur. So there's there's tons of um, organizations and initiatives out there. You can also go to the Kaufman Foundation, which is a huge resource for for entrepreneurs. Uh, another one I like a lot is called Rise of the Rest. That's one of Steve Case's initiatives. They go around the country funding companies. In fact, he's raised two funds in the last like three years, $150 million each, specifically focused on early stage businesses um, and funded by the entrepreneurs across the country that we do know, the Mark Cubans, the Howard Schultz, the Sarah Blakely's, the people like that. Um, Jeff Bezos, people like that. So there, there's a lot of initiatives out there um, to support entrepreneurship. And now more than ever, those initiatives are focused not solely on the coasts, but actually on the flyover states, on Spread. areas across the country. And I'm seeing more and more exited entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley and Boston, New York, going back home to where they're from to help build the entrepreneurial community and culture there. So super, Isn't that interesting? super exciting stuff. Yeah, I love it. So when someone is looking for a mentor, what, what are the characteristics that uh, an, an entrepreneur, a would-be entrepreneur would look for? Like this is the type of person, if they just do a Google search and they meet up for coffee, what, what type of, where, where's the Trey Bowles that's in Orange County, that's in Phoenix, that's in Denver? Uh, kind of, what do they do to ask those questions to feel like this person, I, I, can I trust them? Can they help me? Sure. So, um, so first of all, the, the, the brilliant thing about mentorship is that you don't have to meet with the Trey Bulls in your community because that, that guy or that girl only has a certain amount of experience. Like I've only built certain kinds of companies. So if you come to me and say, hey, I'm in the healthcare space and I need help building this new prototype for, um, um, you know, a PPE or a new COVID drug or whatever the case may be, I have absolutely no idea to help. But what you're looking for is you're looking for mentors, subject matter experts in your industry that have an experience or skill set that you don't. And that experience could just be that they've been doing it longer. It could be they do finance in this space and you're an engineer. It could be that they do marketing and you're an engineer or you're a business person and you don't know an engineer. It's, so it's, it's about that networking and marketing piece coming together. Um, and there's enough organizations out there that are doing cool stuff that you can find into. There's startup weeks in a lot of these major cities. You can look up startup weeks in your areas or startup weekends. There's a great, there's several great national organizations that do 
like accelerators to help you go in like tech stars and things like that. But once you start to search, you're going to find stuff and it'll just take you down rabbit holes. And pretty quickly, you're going to get to the, the sum of resources that exist in your given community. And it's not going to take long to get involved because this is still a startup. Like it's not real business yet. Right. So there's not thousands and thousands of business trying to trying to get in and support startups because you don't have any money and you can't pay them. So but what the great thing about startups is and about early stage entrepreneurs is they don't remember the people that helped them when they didn't need to. Right. So if if at t comes into your community and offers a special deal for small businesses or early stage businesses, well, that's fine. That may give at t a, a, a new account or two new accounts. But what happens when that two accounts becomes 50, becomes 100, becomes 1,000, becomes 20,000? Those entrepreneurs are not leaving at t ever because at t helped them when they started, right? Or banks or thing or accounting firms and law firms and, and stuff like that. Startups don't know three accounting firms to choose from. They just know that this woman named Julie showed up one day and said, hey, I'll help you figure, fill out your uh, balance sheet. And so you're looking for people that have a set of experiences or skill sets that you don't. Um, and if it's done correctly and positively in your community, there's access to networks like that. At the very minimum, there's something called SCORE, which is called Senior Core of Retired Executives. There's a bunch of initiatives out of the federal government, some of which I think are great, um, some of which I think could use improvement, all of which um, are determined, their success or effectiveness is determined by the people involved. And so some cities have amazing SCORE um, programs with really established, experienced uh, exec retired executives. And some of them are, you know, retired executives looking, looking for something to do. But there's just an amazing amount of resources if you go looking for them. So just yeah. Google entrepreneurship Peoria, Illinois, right? Or entrepreneurship Detroit. There's stuff everywhere. Um, and if not, there's a bunch of, a bunch of great resources online that you can do digitally too. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned at the beginning that an entrepreneur is someone who's driven by a passion, right? Where is that? Where is that crossover with? I have this passion. I have this vision to. No, it's freaking like COVID. I want to get ready for 2020. I want a business that can thrive in this new COVID era. Uh, see a need, meet a need. I'm just going to go and do that. So, how do you think about someone who's listening and go, I don't, I don't know that I have a passion right now, but I see a need, and should I just go after that? And what kind of needs are you seeing people chase down right now that that um, you know opportunities? Right. So, so I like to talk about this concept of. Um, of calculated entrepreneurship or the idea of jumping into entrepreneurship rather than diving in. I think what, what we're told for some reason or what we believe growing up is that, well, if we really want to be an entrepreneur, we're going to empty out our savings account. We're going to empty out our 401k. We're going to put everything into the business and we're going to go on because the only people that make it are the people who give up everything. I think that's hogwash, right? I think that's just stupid, right? But calculated entrepreneurship or jumping into entrepreneurship. Think of entrepreneurship as though it's this pond, right? And you want to jump into that pond and you want to take advantage of everything entrepreneurship has to offer. Well, it's not wrong, illegal or questionable to walk over to the edge of the pond and, and look in, right? Is there any water in there? If so, how deep is it? If you jump in, is there a way out? That's sort of my analogy for what I call the feasibility analysis, which is trying to determine, is my idea a company, right? So I may see a need and I may say, wow, gosh, this, I just heard about this podcast. This guy was in the PPE and made $50 million. I want to make $50 million. Well, there's a bunch of questions you have to ask yourself. Do I have the ability, the know-how, the connections, the finances? Do I have all these things necessary to really exploit that opportunity, leverage or realize that opportunity? And if I don't, then that's not something I should be doing. And so you've got to go through this feasibility analysis where you're looking at market fit, you're looking at your competitors in the space, you're looking at um, customer bases. Is there a customer base and how do I develop that customer base? I mean, those sorts of things are just things you need to do. Um, otherwise, you're making an uneducated decision. You're diving into entrepreneurship. And, and the, the worst thing about diving into entrepreneurship is you could break your neck. When you jump in, you may bruise your tailbone, 
but you're not going to break your neck. And so right. think about that as you're evaluating opportunities, as you're seeing needs that exist, make sure this is a mistake we make a lot of times, make sure that just because you feel that it's a need that you don't just assume everybody else does um, That's right. because that ends up being problematic. But, but times like this, you know, little, little things like, well, I, I went to my county, I mean, Dallas County's perfect idea. I went to Dallas County on their website. It says we're buying PPE, PPE equipment, and this is how much we'll pay for it. And these are the specs. Okay. Well, can I go create that and do that? And can I ensure that they're going to pay? Okay, great. That's a huge opportunity. And so people that I saw really leveraging that with people that already had manufacturing, uh, uh, warehouses and systems in place. They just modified what they were manufacturing. That's an yeah. easy extension, an easy pivot or refocus or additional product line. If you don't have any access to, to uh, making masks or um, visors or whatever the case may be, then yeah, maybe you could make them at home, but how many can you make at a time? And if, if you can make four in a day, it's probably not a good business idea. With your with your three D printer in your in your garage, you can make four of them in a day. Uh, I think it was Derek Sivers that said, uh, "I only sell things that people want to buy." <laughs> right. That's why I say entrepreneurship isn't an intellectual thing; it's an experiential thing. Right. Lots of people who aren't super smart or super bright make lots of money, and yeah. it's because they they have a gut and knack and understanding for what somebody will buy. And yeah. some people are really good at saying, I'm going to figure out what you're going to buy and I'm going to make that for you. And that's a, per yeah. that's a perfect example. Um, so somebody like me, I'm not usually passionate about any specific thing. I'm a passionate, I'm passionate about the process. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about building something. I'm passionate about engaging with people and, and supporting and supplying them with, experience and connectivity and really helping them grow to the next level. So I'm the kind of entrepreneur that is passionate about whatever it is that I can get passionate about. I don't wake every morning. I wake up every morning and say, I've got to make pens or my life's not complete. Um, some people have that, that passion and that calling where they're so specific about what they want to do. That's the only thing they can do. The key is you have to, you have to be able to stick with it. You've got to be able to prove a market. And then on the other side, I, people always ask me, what is your biggest, What's your one word of advice? If you could give an advice to anybody that want, would want to be an entrepreneur, what would it be? Uh, and I always say, that's easy. Don't do this. This is a horrible idea. 90% <laughs> of the people that try it fail at it. Or 90% of the businesses that exist fail. Um, on the other hand, you need to look at it like this. If the worst thing that could ever happen to you is that you start a business that doesn't work. I don't consider it failure, but you start a business that doesn't work. If you can be okay with that, then you have nothing to lose, right? So, so it's a difficult thing to do. It's it's a low probability thing to do in terms of being successful, but we all should do it. And we all probably should do it a couple of times because most people don't succeed on the first time. Yeah, that's it. That's what I was thinking is that is that it's, it's not a failure. It's just a learning. And probably a lot of people, uh, may, maybe this is true for you or for a lot of people that you work with, I'd be interested to know, like wh which business is it that, that hits? It's, it's like a, an author. You, you write several books, but it's not you know, until the sixth book that people recognize it. You start several companies, but most of them fail or just kind of limp along for a while, but this one really takes off. Has that been your experience? A lot of times, and it's, it, it, that's the experience piece, right? It's yeah. not because your first idea wasn't a good idea. It was because you didn't know that you had to file taxes, right? Or you didn't know that when you hire somebody paying $50,000, that's not the only cost that goes into having an employee. You didn't know all these things, which none of that is a character flaw. All of that is things that can be fixed by learning, by knowledge, by experience. And so um, what tends to happen is people don't make the same mistakes. Um, they, don't, they don't recreate those same issues. And over time, they get better and better and better at not doing that, which elongates the amount of time that the money they have for a project can last because you're not wasting money. And then eventually one of them starts to grow and, and be successful and, and go from there. And I think that's a, a fundamental piece of what makes business um, and entrepreneurship um, an opportunity and you learn and you learn and you learn and you grow and you grow and you grow. And, 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 but you also have to remember that the, the entrepreneurs that do well are not the ones that think I'm going to do this and make a lot of money. I'm going to do this and be successful. Those people are destroyed by it. 
because mm. they're focusing on the wrong thing as opposed to I find joy in this. I find fulfillment, satisfaction in this. I want to, you know, supply a product or service that I think people need or that I know people need. And, and they go out, they go out and they do that. And that's a big piece when you're really looking at the longevity and persistence it takes to be successful. If you don't have a passion for it, it's going to be really difficult to stick it out through the highs and lows and the roller coasters or switchbacks that we see um, in, in entrepreneurship in that journey. Yeah. I was just talking with somebody on the phone yesterday, one of my coaching clients, we were talking about uh, where he's at with his company. He might not have thought himself as an entrepreneur, but he was this expert and he was, he had this expertise and he was like, well, I might as well just form it around myself and do it myself. And so he's built this thing and now he's wrestling Trey. I'm sure that you uh, deal with this. It's like, you know, the, your own success now becomes your problems. He's at that, he's at that pivot point of, do I scale this thing and bring on a bunch more people that were, that I can't manage personally anymore? Or do I just stay in this sweet spot? How do you coach people that are kind of at that? Do I go all in and keep building or do I just keep it that I can manage as a, as a one man show with these contractors uh, how should someone think about that kind of a decision? Well, I think it really depends on the person and what their real desire is, right? Because once you start to grow, you lose a little bit of control. You got to start trusting people and you got to start empowering people because you recognize I can't, can't oversee every single detail anymore. And if that's a problem for you, then don't grow. Um, the other side of it is, is I tell people this all, all the time. They say, you know, as a CEO, what should I do? And I say, I wake up every day. I do the best I possibly can at running my company and I try to find um, feverishly find somebody better than me to run my own company. Because mm. if you could have Michael Jordan on your basketball team, would you sit out so he could play for a team that you own? Absolutely you would, right? We all should be looking for the Michael Jordans who want to help build our, our business. And in some cases that's not, doesn't make a ton of sense, especially if you are the business, if you're the brand and if people are hiring because of you. But what it does mean is if we want to scale and want to grow something, we really have to be ready to, to, um, to trust, to, um, to share responsibilities, to delegate, um, and then also recognize the opportunity that can come with that and the freedom that comes with that and, and, and the benefit of being able to do that. But if that's not you, it's your business. Do whatever you want to do. And so you've got to make that decision. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Trey? What, what are you What are you passionate about right now, other than empowering other entrepreneurs? Is there something that's got you excited that you want to try that you that you're developing as a little you know side project? Yeah, so so I have ideas all the time, and I'm always running it through my own feasibility process. Um, I sort of go through and I after I can check off all the reasons why something won't work, then I start to look at okay, well let's go through the reasons why they do work. And so I'm, what I've been built to do is I've been built to help um, and through ser servant leadership to build, um, to build things and build people um, with an impact driven ROI, not just, not just a, a financial ROI, but not excluding a financial ROI um, for the purposes of growing and building uh, these awesome projects. And so that's what I'm constantly looking for is, new ideas, new opportunities. I've always got a bunch of things going on, but as I now exit this space of uh, sort of the, the full-time nonprofit stuff I've done for the last decade or so and, re and return back to the for-profit space, that's really what I'm starting to look at is I've developed a filter uh, for myself to look at and really understand does somebody fit in that, in that does an opportunity fit in that filter or does if it doesn't, and if it doesn't fit in there, I got to get it out of there. And I've got to be really clear and concise and focused on what my skill set is, what I bring to the table, what I can do and, and be successful in, and then and bring in other people to do those other things. And before we hit record, you were telling me that you just got, gone away for a little retreat and that you were meeting with this uh, expert that was helping you kind of do some interior mining. Uh, what do you really want to do with the rest of your life? Where, where do you really want to invest? Where do you want to go? A, a life plan, uh, if you will. Uh, what, what came out of that? What did you appreciate about that time? And did you have any insights that came out of it? Well, and you know this being a coach, but, but, but I think what a good coach does well 
is a coach pulls out of you what's there. You don't go to a coach and say, what do I do? And he or she says, do this, do A, do B, do C. They really are trying to uncover what's in you already. And so, um, and so what he did was sort of just uncover what was inside he had, through asking questions, through going through exercises, doing different programs and things that, they, that you guys do, um, which is helpful. But really what it showed me was that, yes, I am indeed an entrepreneur, right? There's many times in an entrepreneur life, um, lifetime where you think, well, should I just go get a job? Should I do this? Should I do that? And um, I always laugh because I say the difference between an entrepreneur and a non-entrepreneur is as an entrepreneur, I've never once looked on my calendar and seen payday and thought, oh gosh, I'm getting paid. I'm always thinking the exact dollar amount that's coming out of my account to pay all my employees, which I'm happy to do, but it's just a different mindset. And so, so what he sort of said to me was, yeah, look, you're a builder. That's what you were created to do hundred um, percent. And so embrace that. Don't, you know, don't run from it. And then specifically, as you say, you want to move back into this for-profit world in this for-profit space, we need to start making decisions that put you in the best possible place to be able to focus, to be able to um, commit, um, to be able to, to be replenished and refilled so you've got energy, but also so you're focusing on the things you say are priorities like your faith and your family and different things like that. And so it was just a process of a lot of affirming um, what I thought and then a lot of really clear, non-biased um, encouragement and, and direction that I probably needed. Um, I can help any entrepreneur in the world very easy for me. It's very hard for me to take my, the same advice, right, that I'm giving someone else. And, and I think we all feel that way. Um, so I, I'm a big believer in the idea of, of coaching and life planning and business coaching and, and personal coaching, because I think it's really helpful, um, to have somebody aid in that process of pulling out of you, yeah. um, being a thinking partner as one of my friends who's a coach here in Dallas says, um, it's really, it's really positive. So for me, it was good. I got to take my bride with me, which was great because I would say something and I'd kind of look at her and say, is that? That true? Like, am I right? <laughs> and so she was able to add context that I can help the process do, but uh, I couldn't say enough about how I, how important and how much of a, an investment I think it is. It's not really an expense as much as it is an investment if you're willing to listen and heed the kind of advice that somebody like yourself could give, give an yeah. entrepreneur or a person. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, faith and family. A lot of people, when it comes to business and making money, like they, they love their thing or they hate their thing. Either way, it's a separate thing. And they're like, the rest of their life is over here. Uh, I can tell by the way that you're talking about your investment in humans and just wanting to be yourself and help other people thrive that you've intersected those things that like faith or spirituality, it, it, it's not a separate compartmentalized thing from your work life. How do you think about that for you? Uh, and how do you coach other entrepreneurs and having like an integrated life where their business and their pursuits of their goals kind of aligns with their values and their spiritual life? So I think it's, I think it's a couple of different things. I think at once it's, it's proper prioritization and really thinking about that, allocating time to certain things in a way that is, um, you know, somebody asked me the other day, what, what's your hope? And I said, my hope is that my kids would tell you that they're my number one priority other than my faith, mm -hmm. right? So it's one thing to tell everybody, my kids and my wife are my top priority, but do they think that? Do they feel that way? <laughs> that's what I want to have happen. And so right. that's a component of it. The other component of it is realizing and, and, and managing expectations, having a, a, a spouse or a partner that supports who you are. Fortunately, my wife knew who I was before I got married. And she is very um, supportive and encouraging that. She also is very good at holding me accountable to the things that she thinks that I need to do or, or not do. Um, <laughs> and so the reality is there, there's also though, to be completely transparent, there is an itch that entrepreneurship and building things scratches that my family and that my wife don't scratch. Um, and so that is a temptation, right? I think that for, for me and my faith, I believe God gives us certain gifts and talents on earth that he leases to us to use. And then when we do that, when we operate in those gifts, it's really worshipful to him. Yeah. Um, but I think where the, the devil comes in and can be um, 
can, can fool us is by coming in and saying, hey, you're really good at this. Keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, which then makes it an idol in your life and ends up making it sin, not worship. And so it's just this constant process of sort of checking in and checking out. And there are going to be seasons of your life where you're building something and you're like, hey, look, I'm, I've got three weeks right here where I, I'm, just, I'm not going to be home. I've got to get this done. This is an important part. And, and it's that negotiation back and forth and that, and that, and that wife and, or her spouse and her partner and kids are able to say, look, we understand this is a time thing. This is, this is something that needs to be done, uh, but it's the exception, not the rule. And so I just encourage people a lot of times to really um, have those open um, conversations manage those expectations to communicate, um, but then also be willing to hear if your wife says, Hey man, you're, this is too much. You got to stop. Well, then you have got to listen to that. Um, and you've got to respond to that, to that, to that urging. And, and that's why I think it's good for, you know, couples to go to marriage counseling, even when things are great. Um, and to, to, to communicate, explain to your kids the way it works. But, but entrepreneurs have a, uh, it's also great to surround yourself by community of other entrepreneurs. I have I have Christian entrepreneurs in my life that I meet with and talk to a lot because they recognize that I'm coming from every every problem with the same source. And if I'm not doing that, they can call me on that or ask me on that or encourage me in that. Um, but they're also there because they've been through some things that I haven't been through and they can share that experience and help make me more effective and, and vice versa. So. It's just a, it's a dance that you have to make. And the best way to do it is if you're proactive and you communicate about it. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Well, and even just as you've been talking, you set a good example of you took your wife with you. You take your wife with you, it sounds like, when you can or on this last little retreat that you did. And I've seen on Instagram that you take your kids and do daddy donut dates uh, every Saturday. And that's something that you build into the rhythm. Um, and so I just affirm that that's who you are. You live in that tension. I'm sure that there's weeks where it feels out of balance, but, uh, I have seen you be that guy consistent, consistently over now, you know, almost 15 years that I've known you. So I appreciate that about you, Trey. And wow. I appreciate that you, uh, you've invested in so many lives. You've made your, not only your city better, uh, by helping people do their callings, uh, but now your ripple effect is all over the place. And uh, and I appreciate that about you. I appreciate you being willing to take this time to uh, drop some truth uh, on this Spirit Farm community. Thank you for that. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so glad I got to do this. I've been following you for 15 years as well. And it's been amazing to see what God's been doing through you and, and the leadership opportunities he's creating and the in, impact and influence you're having as well. So an honor for me to be on the show and to get to hang out with my friends for a little bit um, on the podcast. Absolutely, man. What about uh, people that want to connect? Should they just follow you on Instagram? Is there a better way to to keep tabs on the work that you do? Inst- Instagram's great. That's a great way to connect and and um, and LinkedIn. Um, uh, uh, if you just, I think you have to put my email address in, but it's trayboles at gmail.com is the easiest. And, and I'll, and I, and I'd love to connect with people and help in any way I can, but, um, we'll throw it up fun to see, yeah. get to connect and, and learn from people that way too. Awesome. Thanks, Trey. Thanks buddy. I appreciate it.